they if they want us to as well. Okay. Okay, well, we'll get started then. So good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Denise Whitford. I'm an assistant professor here at Purdue University. I work in special education. I'm also a former uh, middle school resource teacher. Uh, here at Purdue, my research focuses on issues of discriminatory discipline and improving academic and behavioral outcomes for at-risk students. And I am Dr. Kelly Carrero, and I'm at Texas A&M University Commerce. I am an associate professor uh, in the special education and um, psychology department, and I um, have previously worked in settings with um, early childhood settings for kids with disabilities. I've also worked in a juvenile justice facility, substance abuse day treatment center. Um, I've worked in an alternative uh, disciplinary center for third with a third grade class. Um, and then I've worked in a classroom for children with autism and very severe behaviors. And I think it's important to note that the district and um, the juvenile detention, well, the district in which I worked had 96 different languages spoken. Um, so we had an incredibly diverse group of students where I, um, in the district. And so, um, so I've always served kids just from very, very diverse backgrounds. And then the, uh, the juvenile detention facility where I worked, it was in um, a, a large metropolitan area. So it was also pretty diverse. Um, and my research focuses on pretty much any kind of strategy that can and um, make sure that we have equitable service provision for all children, uh, but particularly for children with behavioral health concerns who come from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. It's a mouthful. <laughs> it is a mouthful. And when we write it, it sounds like a mouthful. So, I mean. Very true. Yes. So <laughs> what you've uh, tuned in tonight is really a partnership between two CEC special interest divisions. So the Council for Children with Behavioral Disorders and DDEL, which is a mouthful of information, but it's essentially for culturally and linguistically diverse students. Um, what we were told was that members from both um, special interest divisions had requested webinars or other types of professional development. And so they were kind enough to put this first one. And I believe there are several more that are gonna come after it, which um, I think they'll publish um, so long. Okay, this is okay. Okay, I'm over there. Oh, whoa. Oh, what was that? <laughs> no, there's, I think um, we can hop on and mute some people. So I think friends, yeah. friends have just met each other. So that's a great thing. Okay. No, no. I don't know how to mute them. I'm going to work on it. Uh, or maybe I just cut them. I here, know. let me do it. I just cut them. I, I don't see anything. I'm going to do mute all. Yesterday I was here. Sure. A meeting in here. And Today they had a meeting at C Commons. Everybody was there. Yeah. Uh, I thought that was going to do it, but I don't think so. Is that better? There we go. I'm unmuted myself. Okay. okay. And can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, let's see. So again, thanks for coming to this webinar. Uh, this is really a topic uh, that we thought. Um, could kind of be uncomfortable. Uh, it brings up a lot of emotions for different people living in the US. It's not gonna be completely comfortable to talk about, but as Kelly says, and what she's gonna talk about later on in the, in the webinar is that really we grow in our discomfort and we believe that the information you walk away with will be really useful for you in your school settings. So let's see if we can talk a little bit more. So when it comes to this webinar and how it's gonna progress, we'll start out with some general knowledge. We uh, recognize that most of you are here because you know the challenges that CLD and other at-risk students face in both general and special education settings. Whether that's from reviewing the literature or from experiencing a lot of these challenges firsthand. But for those of you who need a little bit more information or a refresher, we're gonna go through some general knowledge about the experiences of CLD students and other at-risk students in K-12 settings here in the US. Um, after that, we'll talk about theory and promising strategies and then move into discussing how you can take the information presented and apply it to your own settings and your own situations. Then, of course, we'll save some time for some question and answer session at the end. So we're going to get started. Maybe we'll get started. Let's see if I can get it to work. There we go. I think there's a bit of a lag. So tonight you'll frequently hear us use the term CLD 
at risk, and intersectionality, so we thought it was best to explain what we mean by those. When it comes to CLD, that really stands for culturally and linguistically diverse learners, and that can include students of color, new arrivals to the US, that could be English language learners, and there are other students that fall within those categories but might go by a different name. Yeah, I think there's a bit of a lag. Kelly, could you go through the, um, the slides for me? Sure. Sure, thanks. You, I think you might have to stop controlling. Ah, oh, there we go, Never mind. We're okay, good. so when it comes to at risk, when we talk about students who are at risk, we're really talking about students who are at risk for school failure, low academic performance, those who are at risk for receiving office discipline referrals, for receiving suspensions and expulsions, and other severe forms of punishment. We're also talking about those who are at risk for being identified for special education services, those for being categorized into certain disability categories, or being placed in the most restrictive special education settings. Now, depending on the setting or the geographic region, this typically include, includes CLD students from economically disadvantaged backgrounds and students with disabilities. We do want to emphasize that at risk can be dependent on your location. So, for example, if we considered at what, what category of student might be considered at risk in one district may not fall into the same risk category in another school district. Um, but tonight we're really gonna focus on CLD, socioeconomic status and emotional and behavioral disorders as our target at risk learners. And so I can see we've got the, the, the common graphic pop up. Um, intersectionality is another term that we're gonna use. So it's a framework for conceptualizing a person, a group of people, or a social problem. Um, the figure that you see here on the right may look familiar. Um, intersectionality takes into account multiple overlapping identities and experiences, really in order to understand the complexities of the person, the group, or the situation. So each one of us has aspects of our lives or our experiences that contribute to who we are as an individual. It would be troublesome, really, for us as teachers to believe that we know a student based on one identity marker um, as the whole student. We really need to consider who the whole child and really all of the intersecting experiences that each child brings to the classroom and why they interact with their peers and with adults in the way that they do based on those experiences. Thank you for going to the next slide for me. Um, okay, so we wanna give you a little bit more background regarding our biggest areas of concern when it comes to CLD and other at-risk students in K-12 settings. They are in academic and performance, as you can see up here on the screen, school discipline and special education identification and placement of services. We're gonna give you some basic background information in these three areas before we move to theory and why these issues are occurring and then provide you with some strategies to work toward improving these areas for really all of the students that you teach or serve in your settings. Okay, so the next few slides, we're gonna talk about some data. One of the great resources that you can use if you're interested in looking up uh, publicly available academic stats for students in the US is through the National Center for Education Statistics. Um, if you go to the address here, bottom right-hand corner, you can search this site and really access a lot of pretty interesting information. Um, some of the stuff that we're gonna to pull together is really around race, ethnicity, English learner status, SES, and uh, disabilities. So let's see, the chart we're gonna discuss on this slide is really based on uh, the NEEP data, and it's from 2017. NEEP stands for National Assessment of Educational Progress. And in this chart, what you'll notice is that you're looking at the percentage of eighth grade students at or above proficiency in, uh, let's see, reading, math, and science. And if you wanted to go to the website, you can pull up other subject areas, but we wanted to focus on reading, math, and science here. Um, you'll notice that um, basically no racial or ethnic category of students is performing particularly well as a group when it comes to reading, math, and science, but you'll notice that there are groups that are performing much lower than others. So if you take a look at that, let's see the second column from the left, you've got black and then right next to them Latinx students, and across these three subject areas, um, and American, Indian, Alaska Native students when it comes to math and science, you'll notice that their scores are significantly lower than everybody else. Everybody is low across the board, which is a problem in the United States, but those three groups of students are particularly challenged when it comes to the academic side of things. 
Um, I should also point out that although this data is from the eighth grade assessment, NEEP has data for fourth and 12th grade students. Um, the stats don't change too much, but for some groups of students, they actually get worse as the grade level progresses. And so just for, to give you some background knowledge, we took the eighth grade data. Could you go to the next slide for me, Kelly? Thank you. In this chart, you'll notice that again, proficiency across the board is not really acceptable, um, but the proficiency of English learners, it's much lower than non-English learners. And so we're seeing that there's also an issue with this population. When we look at SES, and in this case by uh, free and reduced price lunches, you'll notice that students are eligible for free and reduced price lunches as a group tend to perform uh, much lower than their peers who are not eligible for free and reduced price lunches. Okay, we've got up next students with disabilities and those without disabilities. Again, you're going to notice that those students who have disabilities are performing much lower than their peers without disabilities, which is Typically what we're gonna expect, um, they're, they're, the students that you're tending to work with in special education are at lower grade levels than their peers, and hopefully they're receiving those services that they're gonna to need to work to improve that. The next area of concern, we've got school discipline. Uh, when looking at the issues of school discipline, it's really to get a, a, a bit of historical background. Um, from the research, there's issues surrounding race and school discipline. They've been really widely documented since 1975. The Children's Defense Fund was the first, um, I guess, seminal work that was put out there. The report that they put out in 1975 indicated that black students were being suspended at rates much higher and that they should have been expected for the size of their population. Um, the report had noted, could you click to the next one for me, Kelly, that many suspensions were unnecessary, made no educational sense, and disturbed the interests of the children involved. Now, since that time, in the 1980s, the federal government implemented zero tolerance policies really to over combat or to combat the war on drugs. And what we found was that zero tolerance was calling for uh, drug related offenses. Um, for people who committed drug-related offenses to, to have severe punishment, really regardless of the severity of the offense. Um, so what you're probably thinking to yourself or asking yourself is really, what does that have to do with schools and what we now call the discipline gap? Well, it's really just due to the perceived success of zero tolerance. What it became really popular in California, Kentucky, and New York for the disciplining of students who had drugs, weapons, or um, participated in gang-related activities. And so far, you might also be thinking, well, of course we don't want students with drugs, weapons, or gang-related activity in schools, and so it's zero tolerance sounds like a good idea. But what ended up happening is that by the early 1990s, zero tolerance became the norm. And so across districts in the US, they expanded beyond drugs, weapons, and um, gang activity, and included the removal of students from other for other behavioral reasons, including things like disruption and insubordination. What we also know is that um, the APA Zero Tolerance Task Force found that zero tolerance in schools um, really mostly was harmful to students of color. And with zero tolerance, schools have been a, seeing a dramatic, really an, an, a dramatic increase in suspensions and expulsions of students from low SES backgrounds and of black students. And so, Lately, we've been seeing um, less of an emphasis on zero tolerance because we know the impact of it, but we're still seeing that there's still an issue and the issues that were happening in 1975 are actually occurring still today in 2019 and might be getting worse for some populations of students. So, special education. Uh, when it comes to identification placement special education, there's been some controversy regarding the data, and so I'm going to let Kelly go ahead and, and um, provide you with that background. So um, oh, I want to first acknowledge that um, that as we watched, as Denise kind of explained that historical um, uh, kind of underpinning of discipline, we've actually seen the same exact thing, uh, trends reflected in special education. Um, and uh, even as far back as when there was desegregation of schools, and so there was the Brown versus the Board of Education, and that was, I think, in the 50s, but it wasn't until the 70s that it was again, um, uh, there was another piece of legislation that came through that said, no, seriously, you have to start integrating schools because then there were 
kind of this same idea as gerrymandering where there was, um, you know, moving of zones and lines and so forth to continue to kind of uh, segregate and disenfranchise um, and send only certain amounts of money to certain spaces. So um, all of that to say that this is, I, I think what's really important to understand um, and I'm constantly talking about this. I mean, Denise hears me talk about this a lot, but I like to say that school is a good, um, it's like a microcosm of our society, right? So school is the space where we're supposed to be training citizens um, and community members. And um, when we start to see kind of the trends that are not healthy or dysfunctional or disparaging or disenfranchising for community members um, in our nation, um, a lot of times, if you look at our schools, unfortunately, you will see them there as well. So um, the beautiful thing is, is that we're educators on this webinar right now. And so we actually have a space where we can be agents of change. And, um, and that's the exciting part, in my opinion. Um, okay, so that was, I just wanted to take my opportunity while well, I had a microphone to say that. <laughs> okay, so now I'll acknowledge the uh, debater controversy in the special education um, identification. So, so there's actually been quite a debate most recently, I think it was in 2015, and um, both CCBD's uh, uh, journal has published about this um, uh, debate as well as DDEL's journal. Uh, multiple voices both have spoken on the issue and um, that's that a report came out um, it has been understood since 1968 that um, children of color have been disproportionately represented in uh, special education meaning they are more likely to be identified as having um, an exceptionality so um, you know that's been happening since 1968 and there was um, there was a, a professor a scholar his name was Dunn and he said, you know, I don't know if this is special ed is really justifiable. I'm not really sure that, you know, it, sound, it seems like we're just kind of sending kids, you know, down the hallway um, and that they really don't have a disability. They just haven't maybe had access to the same opportunities for learning. Um, and we know that in our current um, uh, IEPs, when we're drafting those IEPs and we're giving our assurances to our families, we say that this is because this child has a disability and not because they've had um, a lack of opportunity for education, to access education. And it's not because of culture and it's not because of language um, or lifestyle. And so those are the assurances that we give. And unfortunately, it's not really reflected. We the article that came out in 2015 um, was done by Morgan and Farkas and uh, colleagues, and they looked at some old data. Um, I think it was the early childhood longitudinal study. It was a very large data set. Um, and what was so controversial about that is that it had been understood for so long that uh, we understood that children who were um, from diverse backgrounds, basically not white, um, they were going to be disproportionately represented. So Asian is often underrepresented, and then we see Black and Latino overrepresented. Um, and then I would say Native American were overrepresented as well in special education. That had been understood and accepted for a long time. This report came out and said, well, our data says that's not true. They're actually underrepresented. Um, and and that became a big controversy. And, and it's the debate actually continues because now it's coming down to the actual way in which they ran those, those data. Um, and basically, as it's understood, is that Morgan and Farkas kind of ran the data going, holding all things constant and all things equal. Um, unfortunately, all things are not equal. So it's, it's not really, um, it's almost, it's kind of denying these things about privilege and power and, um, and also in biases in our curriculum and um, in the school culture and, and all the things that we're going to talk about today. Um, but that's kind of why the debate is, is so, such a big, it's a big heated deal because it denies it denies the, the truths that we understand, which is that um, schools do struggle to, to be culturally responsive and, um, and they do struggle to really acknowledge all the children and all the different backgrounds. And um, oftentimes, you know, it's very much through the lens of um, the, the, the average teacher, which is often a middle-class white woman. So um, through, because that's the lens in which most things in education have been built around, it, um, it, I know that we're trying, but it, as of right now, it, it is not, um, 
fully encompassing or reflective of our student population. Okay, Denise, no. that was a long-winded <laughs> yeah. explanation. Sorry. It was, it was really, really well said. And thank you. What, what it really comes down to is that clearly there's, there are major issues, challenges, um, barriers, whatever you want to call it. Um, there are problems with equal access to quality public education for culturally and linguistically diverse students and other at-risk students. So common sense really tells us that these, these three areas are interrelated. And so if you think about it, if a student isn't well supported academically, um, whether that's in gen ed or special ed, their, their potential really for, for proficiency is gonna be impacted. And the same thing goes for being supported behaviorally. Quality classroom management isn't being implemented and students who need extra support aren't being provided that support. Their potential for learning or access to the learning environment isn't gonna be, is gonna be impacted. So if a student demonstrates academic or behavioral challenges within the classroom, they're often removed from that environment without proper supports. And the odds are that really their academic performance is gonna further deteriorate, deteriorate. And if that same student is moved to a restrictive or more restrictive special education setting, the research really does tell us that performance is likely to continue to deteriorate because of those lower expectations and the less rigorous requirements. So let me take a quick drink of water. Who was that? Um, Ted Cruz, that's who I feel right, right now. <laughs> <laughs> As I already said, uh, so the potential for these types of situations is exacerbated if the students from a culturally linguistically diverse background or if they fall within one of the other at-risk categories. And the problem really only compounds and it gets more complex when you take intersectionality into that whole uh, equation. Let's see. So we've got some theories. Um, often what the question that when we present this type of information at research conferences, the question that Kelly and I often get are, well, why is this happening? And so we just wanted to briefly go through some theories that have been highlighted out there. And so they include cultural mismatch or conflicting ideals between teachers and students that they teach, um, biased teacher attitudes and behaviors, whether that's implicit or explicit. And then there's also policy and how that policy is or isn't implemented um, at school sites for certain students. So when it comes to cultural mismatch theory, what we do know, like Kelly had just said, was that roughly 80% of our teaching population in public schools here in the US are white middle-class women. And we also know that the majority of the students that they teach don't fall into the same classification. So we also know that intersectionality really has a, uh, an impact on how people, meaning teachers and administrators and other school person personnel, perceive their students and student behavior. And these perceptions may not always align across cultural groups. So for example, if you have a black student who asks questions in class, they might be perceived as maybe um, aggressive or disrespectful, uh, particularly if their tone is different from the teacher's expectations of how that tone should be. Um, instead of seeing that student as maybe a passionate leader or a passionate self-advocate, they're seeing them as an aggressive person or a disrespectful person. And so really this can also be um, exacerbated when a teacher who lacks really a variety of cultural experiences and interactions with similar methods, um, if, they've, if they lack that gaining or understanding of situations and topics, that can really be a problem for students. Um, and another example, you might have a teacher who is unfamiliar with the neighborhood that they're working in. And so uh, I was a teacher in Oakland Unified School District. And so a lot, Oakland. <laughs> a lot of teachers, we came from different areas around the Bay Area. And so we didn't have the experiences of the students that were in our neighborhood schools. And so what I had learned over time, and it, it does take learning and getting to know the community, is that Sometimes you'd have a student who they weren't showing up to school or up to class because they'd be at, you know, a funeral and, you know, somebody close to them had died and that's a regular occurrence. And so you would have teachers who didn't understand that and they would penalize the students because they assumed that they were ditching or things along those types of lines. But really what we need to do is teach teachers to learn about the community so that instead of doing um, penalizing the student for that kind of thing, you're working with them to catch up on missed work or maybe even putting them in contact with service providers who could help them through that type of trauma. 
So it's really about getting to know the students that you're working with. Um, another thing that we, we come across when we look at the theories here are, um, are, is deficit thinking. And so teachers who believe at-risk students, including students with emotional behavioral disorders, can't perform well, are less likely to teach and support them as well. And so there was that study, oh, it was a long time ago, I wanna say back in the 80s maybe, with uh, Bob Rosenthal. And so he had the Pygmalion effect and there were some problems with that study, but at the same time, the, the results still hold true. How you perceive your students is how you're going to treat them, whether that's the intention or not. And so we really want teachers to move away from thinking that students of color, students who are from low socioeconomic backgrounds, students with disabilities, we want them to stop assuming that they can't do it. Um, we also have the problem with policing of certain students. And so essentially a teacher who looks for a problem is eventually going to find a problem. Uh, if teachers are laser focused on one student in the room or a group of students, what they might begin to realize is they're really nitpicking at behaviors versus acknowledging that others in the room are demonstrating those same types of behaviors. Or maybe that the behavior isn't a real issue. It's just something that if you're policing students and you're looking for that behavior or for challenging behavior, you're might more likely to find it. Did you want to add to that one, Kelly? I, I did want to add to that. I mean, I think this is something, I'm, I'm making the assumption that the majority of people on this webinar are uh, either special educators or they support special educators. And mm -hmm. we see this happen all the time when we bring our student with who has an IEP, we bring them into an inclusive environment, um, you know, if you, you, the general ed teacher might report back what's happening with that student and it's, oh my gosh, she did this, that, and the other. And then if you go in and take normative data, you start looking around the classroom, you go, well, I mean, actually, did you notice that they were all doing that? Or like a good 60% of the students in the classroom were doing the exact same behaviors and some of them were doing worse behaviors. But since your student has an IEP attached to him or her, then that child, um, gets more policed oftentimes, right? Um, and definitely reports come back about that child, especially kids um, who have challenging behaviors, who have come from a more restrictive setting, um, who have been kicked out of school for a time. Um, and then when they're reintegrating um, back into the, to the school population, then they're being policed constantly. So um, it, it only kind of makes things more challenging than they already kind of were. But this absolutely happens with race and background as well, of course. So it's with disability, but that intersectionality of disability and um, diverse backgrounds as well. Do you want to cover the cultural competency continuum? Yeah, let's do it. Oh, sorry. We're oh. both controlling the screen. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Sure, go you ahead. do it. Okay, I'll do it. Okay, go the other way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so this is, um, this, this visual, it, it demonstrates the cultural um, competency continuum. And I love this. This was um, from, this is actually from, adapted from Cross et al. And they are, I think Cross, I think they're a group of counselors or social workers. But, um, so they were really talking about organizational cultural competency. And, and I do think that I found this work because years ago when I started, you know, really investigating, you know, cultural responsive practices and so forth and, and bias in the schools, I thought, okay, but what is the model? Like, how do we assess ourselves? How do we know where things are getting better? And um, where are we? And, and, and it, this is very, very challenging. And, and any of the, uh, you who are on um, and have to do, you know, report things for disproportionate representation, um, of your students and then what you're doing about that, or if there's faculty who are having to talk about um, how you're addressing diversity in your teacher prep programs, it's really challenging to identify a good assessment. So um, I saw this cultural competence continuum and I, I thought this is a really good way to kind of look at your organization, so your school, um, and really think about where, it's also I see it as a self-assessment, so you're kind of going, where am I um, on this continuum? I think it's important to understand as well, and, and you guys can read this, um, but I, I think it's important to understand that we are in different spaces all the time. You never quite arrive to that cultural proficiency, uh, even if you feel like you do. Um, you may, you may 
get there in some spaces, but because individuals and cultures are so incredibly nuanced and diverse, you really will find that you're kind of moving in and out of each of these spaces. And that's based on any kind of identifier that you're, um, that maybe you don't identify with, but that you're learning more about and you're getting more experiences with, um, you might find yourself all up and down this um, continuum. So you can see all the way here towards the left is, is cultural destructivist, uh, destructiveness. And this is, I mean, this is basically racism. It's genocide. It's dehumanizing of minority groups of any kind. And again, that's, um, that can be uh, you know, LBGTQ, disability, this can be um, race and culture, right? That's all of it, considering all of those things, but it's destructive. Um, and then we have all the way at the end, which is the best, and that is um, you're adding to your knowledge of culturally competent practices. You're advocating that we incorporate these practices, thinking about how how we might do that. We're improving our relationships between different cultures. Um, and, and we're always striving. And I would guess if you're here and you're attending this webinar, you're working towards that. Um, and, and that's a beautiful thing. But, you know, this is just to kind of say we're, we're all along this continuum and you might go up and go back down depending on which, um, how many, in my opinion, experiences you're having with a particular culture, background or identification or identity. Okay, so, oh, this is where I get to talk about my microcosms, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, you did give me a picture for it. Okay, so this was, I just, I, I just wanna say again that, um, you know, we wanna remember that the classroom is really a good space for us to be um, teaching, training, um, and uh, create and cultivating our next generation. I mean, I know that's like such a cliche thing to say, but when you really think about how challenging it is right now um, and, and how much information and opinions and everything else that's flying all over the place, um, and a lot of it being negative, I feel like the classroom is a really good space where we get to really, um, we get to really empower our students and we also get to teach them to be um, appreciative of diversity. Um, I, again, you know, and a lot of people will say, oh, I don't notice color and I don't notice difference or I didn't notice that. And, and I know that might seem like a nice thing to say, but but there's actually nothing wrong with difference. You know, um, difference is a wonderful thing and, and thank God there's difference or we would all be robots, right? So, um, so it's a beautiful thing to recognize the difference that exists around you and to really um, celebrate it, learn more about it, ask about it. Um, you know, these are this is a good opportunity to teach children that that, that difference is a beautiful thing. Um, and so we get that opportunity. Um, I also uh, was, I think, wanted to say on this that um, when, you know, uh, when kids are operating outside of the norm, um, if for any way, and I had kind of said this before, that a lot of times, um, you know, the norm is who's in charge, right? So they are um, they're, they're viewing this behavior, these behaviors, and they're going, this is just absolutely unacceptable. Um, I, I, we can't have this in here. And, um, this is not the way this is disrespectful. Um, and really the, you know, the student just in their own home, it might be respectful, right. Um, to, to uh, interact with an adult in that way. Um, I think that, uh, you know, Janice, we were talking about it where there are some, uh, some races and cultures and that where if you're being reprimanded by an adult, you're not to look them in the eyes, right? Um, because that would be a challenge. And so when that student kind of gives you that, you know, they, they are averting eye contact while you're reprimanding, a lot of teachers will say, well, that is so disrespectful. They see it as passive noncompliance. And really at home, it, that child is, is doing what they would be expected to do, which is to just let the parent, you know, continue to, to reprimand them and the child's going to kind of be submissive and, and listen to that. So, uh, but in the school, the teacher might say, I don't appreciate that. You need to look at me when I talk to you. Um, so a lot of the policies um, and, and what the punishments are going to ultimately be, adults, you know, it's discretionary. Um, they get to decide how they're going to implement those things. And so that's why we see that there are harsher punishments for um, children of color, but particularly for children of color who have an exceptionality as well. 
So one of the things that Kelly and I have, we talk about all the time, we do a, a lot of these presentations, but what we talked about was that when there's this issue surrounding student academics, we have you know, interventions to better prepare students. When there are issues surrounding student behavior, we design and implement interventions to modify that behavior. When it comes to issues about representation of students in special education, we change policy. What we find really to be lacking in the research and in practice is that really there's, the, there's a lack of focus on changing teacher and administrator behavior and, their, and the attitudes that they come into the classroom with. So really, how can teachers, administrators, and everybody else who works with the kids in these settings assess themselves and really assess their situations and really work to overcome the biases that everybody walks in with um, on different levels and different types of biases, but how do they assess those and make sure that they're not impacting the way that they treat children? So we're gonna talk about some of the basic behavior principles and then Kelly's gonna walk you through a lot of really good strategies. Thanks. Okay, so I, I wanted to do a very quick primer on just what we understand about behavior, and then, then we're going to try to contextualize it within this idea of pairing it as being a reflective teacher um, and, and when we're with different students. Um, okay, so we all know that there are two basic functions of behavior, or two basic motivations why anybody on the planet ever does anything, and that's really just to gain access to something or to avoid something. Um, and so these are kind of our, I'm, I'm making sure that we're all in agreement here. Although I'm not giving you really a vote, I'm just gonna keep going. Um, <laughs> you can uh, function, we, uh, we use behaviors to gain attention, to gain a tangible or, or um, an activity, or to gain sensory stimulation, or we're trying to avoid that attention, avoid a task or demand, or avoid perhaps like a, an aversive internal sensory stimulation. Um, Understanding those basic ABCs of behavior will help you as you decide, as you start to encounter challenging behaviors and then thinking about what to do about it. So we understand that the antecedents, what happens just before a behavior, the behavior is something that we can observe or measure that's happening in the environment and the consequences, just simply what happens after a behavior. It's not a punishment necessarily um, and it's not at that cultural term consequence. It is simply the, 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 what happens as a result of the behavior. Okay, so now when we're thinking about that skills that are required in order to educate children who come um, from diverse backgrounds, and, and I do want to say diverse backgrounds, I think it's important to say just a background that's different than yours, um, because we should have a diverse group of people on this webinar, and I think that, as Denise stated before, we all come with biases. Um, and so just when you're, when you're listening to this, I want you to be thinking of when she says diverse students, it's really just a student that's different than my background. Um, and so here are a couple of the promising practices that we have. Um, using culturally responsive practices, um, accessing our cultural informants, which is critical, and then being reflective in our practices. And I did see, um, I'm really encouraged, I saw uh, Dr. Will Hunter on the webinar, he's got his class with him, and he's doing some actually very, very cool work looking at how we can actually start to take strategies and practices um, in the classroom, particularly for students with challenging behaviors, and make sure they're culturally responsive. And so it's the work of people like Dr. Hunter, um, and I, I saw um, Sheldon uh, Bratton on there as well, and he does a lot of great work. And so, so it's encouraging. I want you guys to know there are people who are doing this work, um, because right now, quite frankly, we don't have a lot of great strategies. But I'm going to give you the best that I've got. <laughs> okay, so um, here we have, this is just about kind of culturally responsive teaching. You'll hear that again and again and again. Um, and I'm a behaviorist, so I always like to operationalize and I'm always going, what does that even mean? What does that even mean? Um, well, a culturally responsive teacher understands uh, understands basically the historical context of a people. Now, that's really hard to say, right? Again, we bring so many assumptions into um, every interaction that we have with a person. So be very careful, and we'll move on to how you can do that. But what we do, if you don't understand the history of a, of a people or of a group, um, then you really want to work to start to understand those things, um, as well as your own history. Let me be clear in that as well. Um, 
bringing community, this idea of building that culture. Like I was telling you, we are blessed to be in charge of a little baby microcosm where we can prepare them for the world. And um, if we want to have change in the world, we actually get to um, be agents of change. And that's very exciting. And getting the family involved, even when the family may not be, you know, especially if you're working with families who have children with emotional and behavioral disorders, they're not used to being called to the school to, to be partners. Um, it, they're usually having to pick up their kid. They're having to explain why it happened. They're having to negotiate um, whether they're going to be responsible for paying for the computer that was just destroyed. Um, and so their experiences with the school is not always great. Um, but you want to, you know, you want to try, of course, as a teacher to build that involvement and try to get them as involved as possible. It will also assist you in getting to understand their family, what the behavioral expectations are for the child um, truly, and what the parents have, what their expectations are for the child, even as they, the child gets older. Um, and then bringing native language into the classroom. And while this si kind of seems, um, I know people kind of think, what? I don't, I don't know what that even means or what is that even, what are you even saying? Um, I guess what I think is important in this space, and I didn't create this, by the way, this was um, uh, the Kali Napur and Harry that came up with this, with this wheel, but, um, you know, it's, it's this idea of, I understand, we understand English is, is the language in which they're going to be learning academics. Um, most often, of course, there are, I'm in Texas and we have bilingual education, um, particularly for Spanish speaking students, but um, typically it's an English class, right? Um, but I think it's important to, when it, when the opportunity presents itself, to, to say things or understand things or speak about uh, words that, or languages that are spoken in the children's homes, right? So um, I think that if you can bring those things in there and celebrate these, these ideas that there are different languages and, and some people do things differently, that's very, very, very cool. Um, and then if you're looking at culturally linguistically responsive special education, this is from a webinar that DDEL put on in 2013. Um, and really it's very similar of, as the culturally responsive teaching, but it, it also considers that IEP um, and making sure that you are um, using a culturally responsive uh, IEP and you're doing that in your programming. So, so you're always thinking about that. And, and again, I'm a behaviorist. And so I'm thinking social validity. And this is my big secret. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to let it out to you, all of you guys, but I equate, and I would love my colleagues on here who are, are into it. I would love, I'm going to see several of you soon and I'd love for you to challenge me on this, but I really think culturally responsive or cultural responsivity and social validity, in my opinion, are essentially the same thing. Because social validity really says, I, um, I honor and understand and am working towards making sure that you are successful in the spaces in which you operate. Um, and so I'm not trying to you know, map my own culture onto you. I'm going to instead identify what is going to make you successful in the spaces in which you operate, which could be very different than the spaces in which I operate. So I have to really get in tune with that child, with the family, to find out how to best program for that child. Um, of course, getting the family involved in using curriculum um, that's also culturally responsive. Okay, so then I, I'm going to go through some of the stages of learning and thinking about that and as it, as it relates to kind of strategies to move across that cultural continuum or cultural um, competence continuum. So the very first step or your stage of acquisition is to really think about your own biases. So, um, and this is where you have to get to know who you are as a cultural being and start to explore your identity, right? And this can mean so many different things. And I think, oh yeah, good. I do have um, where you can, hear some questions that you can ask yourself. Um, and that's just kind of what identities do I, categories do I most identify with the most strongly and um, when did I even learn about these different identity categories? And, and I will tell you guys um, that if you pay attention to a lot of the different things, especially I'm, I'm very old now, I'm realizing, but man, you know, this, uh, I would say the 20 year olds, they've got some new identity categories that, that I'm just learning about, right? But that is very common vernacular for a lot of the kids. So, um, you know, and, and so anyway, so my point is, is that 
I think that we need to be vigilant and always kind of learning about the way in which other people identify um, and not judging it. it. Even if it's nothing, something we've never heard of before, you know, we're just going to acknowledge it. This is the way in which they're identifying. And in, especially if they're 20, it could change, right? Um, but we want to be thinking about how do we identify um, and, and how would we describe our beliefs about others? Um, and then we also want to think about even that emotional and behavioral disorder. So thinking about even that eligibility, um, you know, what kind of thoughts come up or, or feelings or assumptions come up with when we hear that we are going to get a kid um, with, in, with EBD? Um, what comes up for you and, and what are your assumptions about that kid? And, and so even, you know, we have confirmation bias. We like to be right. Um, but I do want to challenge you to be really reflective on on your assumptions and and then challenge yourself to um, be more flexible. Again, you want to acknowledge that not everyone sees things the same way that you do. And I absolutely love this picture. I'm sure you guys have seen this before. Um, but for those of you who haven't, um, some of you might see a young lady. And so there's a little feather and here's her hair and there's her eyelash. Can you see my, my, my no. cursor? Oh. <laughs> okay, I don't even know how to show you guys this. Oh, nope, that's not it. We can see your cursor moving. No, yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> so there's, here's the young woman. Here's her eyelash. There's her little baby nose. Here's her cheek and her chin. Here's her jawline, and here's a necklace. Some of you might see an old woman where here's her hair. It's kind of a babushka, right? And she's got her head <laughs> scarf on. Um, and this is her nose. And here's her mouth. And here's her chin. And I'm, I'm hopeful that some people are going, wow, or some are going, I don't see it. And they're having to ask their friends about it. Um, but the point of this figure is just that we, we can all be staring at the same thing and still not be seeing the same thing or perceiving the same thing or observing it in the same way. And, and this is just called uh, dissonance, right? It, it's called cognitive dissonance, but I believe that this happens with cultural dissonance as well. And I often see this when I'm communicating with families, and we're going to talk about that um, shortly. So some other contextual factors to consider when we're working with kids from diverse backgrounds, particularly those with emotional behavioral disorders, is that all of these, these different parts, I mean, school is, they have to go there, right? We, we, don't volunteer to show up to work every day, right? We receive a paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> Denise is laughing. Actually, we did volunteer for this webinar, but typically <laughs> we're getting paid for the things that, um, that we do, right? And our kids aren't. They have to go to school. Even if it's the hardest thing that, for them ever to do, they have to show up every day. Um, the next thing is school is really hard, especially if you have an exceptionality. School is hard. Um, and it's hard for all kids to just, I mean, the way in which we've got it set up, there's a lot of sitting, so forth. School is just plain hard now. Um, they also have moderated access to preferences. So when they're home, you know, they're getting to be on their tablets or computers and they're, they're getting to talk with friends or play video games or go outside uh, if they are still into that. Um, but they are, <laughs> they are, when they're in school, that's all really moderated. The teacher decides when in which they're going to have access to their reinforcers. And, and so that can be really hard for kids. Also, our guys with emotional behavioral disorders, they struggle with self-regulation. This is very, very challenging. We're all struggling with self-regulation. I guarantee if I was to peek through these, this, you know, at your camera and look at all of you guys, you're doing self-regulatory behaviors at this time. You know, you're, you're bouncing your leg, you're chewing gum, you're writing your grocery list. Like you're doing certain things to kind of keep you stimulated and keep you listening um, because you're trying to stay accessible for learning. And for our kids, sometimes, you know, it's, it's going to look inappropriate or it's going to look like they're misbehaving when they're really just trying to self-regulate. Um, and that's that popping up to go get their pet, you know, sharpen their pencil. I got to get a drink. I got to go to the bathroom. I got my racer broke. I, you know, I'm chewing on the end of my pencil, all that self-regulation. Um, and then finally, cultural expectations, like I mentioned before, um, you know, there's, there are different expectations in the home or in the community in which the child often operates. It could be very different than what the expectations are in the classroom. Um, and, and that's true of all cultures. Even if the um, culture is the same as the teacher, if the child's culture is the same as the teacher, I guarantee you that that teacher, um, they have different expectations even when they get home 
of their own children than what they would have in the school, right? So um, that cultural expectations piece is, is really important to think about. Kelly, we've got um, a couple questions in the chat box. Did you want to respond to those now or did you want to keep going and respond to them later? Um, we're almost done. I say we finish the last few slides and then go to the questions. That, that would be great. I'm, I'm in for that. Okay, so this is where I, I love this model. I did not come up with this model. Um, Shanaz Garcia was the one who introduced it, um, but she talks about the cultural reciprocity model. And this is where I feel like when I, I feel like talking about cultural responsiveness is like nailing jello to the wall and, and it makes me um, frustrated, which it makes me study it, which, so that's a good thing. But, um, but this is the first thing that I thought, oh my gosh, this is actually like a stepwise protocol I can follow. And that is very comforting, especially as a behaviorist. Um, so the first thing is um, when you're working with, um, with a, I see, I have client up there. When you're working with a family, um, a family and a student, um, or even related service providers, you want to first identify um, what your cultural values are um, and and how they're embedded in your professional opinion. So when you're giving professional recommendations, it's reflective of what you believe is best. Well, why do you believe that's best? And is that something that is reflective of your culture or the culture of kind of quote unquote best practices in education or, um, you know, or is there another way to look at it? I think a, a really great way to see this is like independence. And it's easier when we have kids who have more profound disabilities, but, um, you know, I think medication might be a good way to think about it for kids with EBD, right? So do you, in your professional opinion, think this child should be medicated? Um, you know, if so, why? And maybe the family is really against that. So, um, you know, or you don't really know, but in your own personal opinion, you, you will have a professional opinion about that. Well, think about what is your opinion and why? Um, next, determine if the family recognizes your values and uh, recognizes, sorry, and values your assumptions. So do they even notice what you are, um, where you place your priority or where, what it is that you value, the approaches that you value. And if they don't, then you're going to want to distinguish how their view really is different than your view. And, and this is so important because it doesn't mean one person is right over the other. It simply means it's different. And now we need to know that we're both talking about something different. So let's, let's negotiate this, right? Let's, let's really work this out. Fine. Next, you're going to acknowledge, explicitly acknowledge the cultural difference that's identified and, and, um, and explain the cultural basis. So you're going to say, okay, well, wow, in, um, in my culture, it's really important that the child is able to operate fully independently. And so for that reason, I think it's really important that we, we fade those prompts as quick as possible. Um, and, you know, the, and that's why I'm making these recommendations that you know, you don't hop in there and help um, every time the child asks you for help, right? Or um, it's really our, my, my thinking is that the child is going to um, be able to say out loud to people, I need a break and I need to get out of this space for a minute and calm down. And the parents might be going, no way, no, I'm super uncomfortable with that. I don't want him announcing to the world that he's not regulating himself well. Um, and so now you kind of say, okay, great. So now we at least both know what we value. And then you collaborate with the family to try and find effective ways to kind of adapt the recommendation because you are really training that child to be successful in their environments, right? So I do think it's important in this space to, to let the family know in the school setting, this is what the expectation is. Um, now in the home setting, it could be completely different and, and we're going to support him in both of those. How can we do that? And sometimes you can, and sometimes you simply have to teach that child to code switch and children are smart and children are capable and they can code switch. Um, and, and code switching simply means I recognize that I, I, I can only behave this way in this setting. And then in another setting, I behave in a different way or I speak in a different way with a different communication partner. Okay, so here's a case example. I wrote um, 
just so you guys kind of know, I don't think I cited myself, but I wrote a chapter for the Division for Autism and Developmental Disabilities. They came out with some things, and this was um, a case example that I gave from that chapter. So you'll see on the left-hand side, I have the four steps, and then I have the case example here in the middle, and then to the right, I have some reflective questions that you might ask. Um, and so I don't want to fully read this out to all of you because you guys can do that, but essentially, what this case example shows is that there's a student who's got autism and um, and they just keep, you know, the child keeps burping after lunch right in the teacher's face and smiling after she does it. And, and the teacher's going, oh my gosh, she's doing this for social attention. It's super inappropriate and disrespectful. Like she's burping in my face. I don't, we've got a teacher just to say like, I want to talk to you or I want to play with you to the teacher, right? Um, so the teacher's thinking, all right, why, like you want to, as you're reflecting, think, why would I choose this as a target behavior? Why is this bothering me? Well, you know, because especially when we get into that spaces of respect, right? Um, and then the teacher's thinking about how is this going to really prevent Imani from being successful in all spaces of her life? Well, then the teacher's going to meet with Imani's parents to talk about it, and they're going to see, the teacher's going to say, hey, in, in my setting and in my culture, this is really disrespectful and disruptive. Um, and the parents go, oh, wow, okay, but actually in our home, um, that means that she really enjoyed the meal. So, um, you know, I, we don't see that as offensive at all. Okay, well, then that's really different. So now we have to think about what is that, how, how should I train her? Or what can we, as, a, as, as the, the team, how can we identify um, that she can still do something that works in both settings? So how about we make the target that she, after she eats, she, can, um, she might put her hand in front of her mouth when she burps and then say, excuse me, the food was good. So now she's still doing that behavior. She's still communicating that. Um, and it works in both settings. Now, this is an example of a child with autism spectrum disorders. Um, again, when we're talking about social rules, social norms, um, which is very challenging for kids with autism and very challenging for kids with EBD, uh, you do want to think about what is the appropriate thing to do in this situation, and it might be different in different spaces. In this particular case example, um, the, the behavior response was appropriate in both settings. Okay, um, finally for generalization, and I absolutely love this, it's, it's thinking about being reflective through all the different phases. So as you're working and you're programming for that child and you're assessing that child um, and you're working with the family and you're selecting the interventions and you're implementing it, you want to just kind of, you want to be reflective in each phase of it. So when, um, so as you're making your choices and as you're proposing things to the team, you are considering all of these different intersectionalities that represent the child and represent the spaces that the child needs to be most successful in. So be thinking about all of those things through each phase of your programming. Um, and here are some, this is again from that chapter, and here are some reflective questions that you can ask if you wanna be a cultural responsive special educator. Um, and this is very similar to kind of um, what was has been spoken about before, but. But I think that the, being a reflective teacher is truly what it is to be culturally responsive and cultivate um, a supportive space for kids with diverse background, from diverse backgrounds. Um, I do like this part, how can I actively decrease cultural load? Um, and so that means, you know, when, they're, when, I'm, when I'm talking about something and it is very culturally late and I've got my culture mapped all over this lesson or this behavioral expectation, how can I put this in a, in, a, in a way that is going to be understandable, reasonable, rational for my student um, and that they can buy into and get on board with. I've talked about social validity. Again, this was just the screen where I was going to share with you guys that I think is, um, you know, cultural responsivity and social validity are really, in my opinion, the same thing. Um, and just different ways to say it, but um, it's really making sure that you're considering how can I optimize um, socially appropriate behaviors for my student and not socially appropriate that I think are socially appropriate, but that are actually going to work for my student in all of the settings in which the student operates. Okay. Um, we do have a little bit about where we get our information. Uh, Denise, did you, well, I guess we're kind of both doing this. Um, oh no, Denise, you have something. <laughs> no. Sorry. 
Oh, no. No, no, it's fine. Okay. Oh, look, see, look at this, Lana and Shelton. Look, see, I have Bica up there. Um, so here are some spaces where we get our information. We have um, the journals for uh, CCBD as well as multiple voices for DDEL. Um, we also have the P Behavior Today newsletter, which I uh, might be sending out whenever we send you guys an email, probably asking for feedback or something. I may um, send you guys a little, please, please send us a little 250 a uh, word write-up or a little something um, to contribute to share with your community. Um, this is kind of a space where we do want to hear about your experiences. All of these links will take you to different spaces where we get our information to support um, behavioral interventions and behavioral strategies. This Teaching Tolerance is a website where it actually has lesson plans. It talks about cultivating that community in your classroom. Um, it also talks about how you can implement responsive uh, culturally responsive pedagogy in your class. Um, there we go. Okay, I'm ready for questions. Oh wait, before you end, could you give them your Sorry. spiel about the next generation? I love that. I do want to give you them spiel about the next generation. Oh, you've written it down for me. Thank you. I'm <laughs> like, wait, what did I say about that? Um, yeah, so this goes back to um, this idea that we are able to be change agents and that we you know, racism is not a feeling. I, I heard someone say this uh, not too long ago, and, and I thought it was beautiful. Racism is not a feeling. It is, it is a whole systematic um, uh, oppression, right? And so we actually get to be a part. We are in, working in a system, which is our schools, and we get to actually be change agents there. We get to actually um, completely deconstruct or prevent um, that kind of, that, that, racism i don't even know a better word to say it. i mean is xenophobia all of those all of those isms we get to actually prevent those and and disrupt those and and that disruption will allow us and 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 pr provide our us with opportunities to train the next generation of leaders and citizens and we want to train them to be working at the best of their potential so they can contribute to our society and so I probably didn't say it as eloquently just now as I did to <laughs> Denise when she was like, we should say that. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. But we are all done. Um, we really thank everybody who attended, who's uh, attended tonight. We know some of you have to go. The hour is up, but we are going to stay here and answer any questions that you have. Should I stop sharing? So, um, Kelly and Denise, thank you so much for the webinar. Um, there are a couple questions in the chat box. Doug asked, um, thinking cross-sectionally in a school environment, what would be the best approach to start influencing a change in the paradigm? Staff mm. first approach to create an awareness? Wow, that's fantastic. So um, I'm going to guess that Doug's talking about that cultural um, competency continuum. And he's talking about that throughout the organization of the school or whatever organization he's operating in. And I mean, really, it's, it's um, kind of experts in the area of uh, cultural awareness. They would, in cultural competency, they always say you have to start with yourself. So first start with your own identity and first understanding your own identity. Because I think, um, you know, and when you start to understand and, and own your own identity, that's when you can start beginning to look at how you view the world and the lens in which you use, right? And, um, and then I think it would be a great professional development to kind of do this where first everybody's kind of thinking about their own identity and, we're, and you're kind of asking these guiding questions as to how they can really um, create, look at all those intersectionalities that apply to all of us, right? Each person on the planet and really identify who they are in that space and then share that out, right? And so there is this, again, that's that acknowledgement of celebrating um, the space where we all come from. I will say that in that, it's an interesting activity because a lot of people will have a lot of blind spots and a lot of people um, don't recognize, they'll say, I don't have a culture and and so on and so forth. And, um, or they'll, they'll really struggle to answer that question. And I think that, that um, that's, that's a beautiful place to start because you have to understand who you are as a cultural being, number one, and then start finding out or situating yourself, in my opinion, across that space of privilege and power. 
um, because those are the other two pieces in here, right? Um, and you have to you have to start to kind of become aware of those things, um, and then, but just talking about it, having the conversation. Like I said, it is uncomfortable. It will it makes a lot of people uncomfortable, but it's in the discomfort that people really grow. Um, and um, and that's my recommendation. Denise, do you have something to say? No, I think you said it really well. Thank you. I'm trying. <laughs> we should create a curriculum. We'll get we'll get Will Hunter on this with us no, and create a curriculum. We are. We we've started that actually at Purdue. We have a 12 week training that covers a lot of this information. We're testing it now at the Purdue Polytechnic High School. Perfect. Oh, well, that's neat. Thank you for answering that, Kelly. Claudia Otto, did you want to ask your question, or would you like me to read it? I think I saw that Claudia is still on. So I, I see the question. I could read it out, and I think, Kelly, you'd be, well, there are two questions, so maybe, which one were you talking about, Kim, the English learner one? Uh, yeah, um, both of them. I see there, yeah, there are two questions in, for Cla from Claudia. Okay, so she said, how do we be culturally responsive towards CLD students with this new frame of reference regarding gender identities with respect to ELL students' native language if the language is gender-based. For example, yeah. Spanish is very gender-structured, so how do we appropriately address this when a social framework, validity frame of reference? Oh, that's so cool. I think that's really interesting. And and actually, Urdu um, also speaks with that same, they, they, they apply a gender to their nouns, um, just like Spanish does. So this is something that's actually really um, very common in the romantic languages. I think French does it as well. And um, so, you know, I have to say that th that is something that I have not, the only space I've even seen anybody begin to talk about that is that Latinx. Um, so at the end of la like for Latina Latino is that now um, is the X at the end. Um, and so, but as far as there being actual um, addressing the pronouns. Now, keep in mind that I would say this is something that we will see emerge here in the next couple of years, I would guess. But if you look at many people who historically, or the countries um, that who have gendered language, they are also very, very um, kind of if you were to look at the countries, again, they're still very conservative. So I would say the majority of conservative, again, I'm speaking from an American lens, um, and what does conservative mean to us? And that means to me, I should say that um, it's still, they're, they're slowly coming to recognize, acknowledge, um, and um, I guess you would say accept uh, different ideas of gender. I don't even know that they're to the place of accepting it. I think that there's, it's just starting to become something that's discussed. Um, and so in those native, in those countries where those languages are spoken, I think it's still incredibly taboo um, for, for gender identity to even be something that's discussed. And so I think that's something that we're going to see here in the next probably five to 10 years. We'll probably get some, some understanding of that. But I would guess um, that it's not something that's out there quite yet. Uh, again, like I said, they're putting the X on the end of things, but as far as um, changing the way in which the words are presented, I don't know that that, that movement's happened yet. I would guess there are little subcultures of younger people um, in their early 20s who are starting to create that. Um, this is a guess. I'm just hypothesizing um, that that's what's happening. But but there's nothing that's hit that's reached me yet, um, so I don't have any um, recommendation for that, except for to kind of probably look where younger people are <laughs> communicating online <laughs> with emojis. You're saying, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Okay, so we have another question. Is it possible, and would you agree that perhaps the change may need to start with the teacher, therapist, slash administrator, rather than expecting the parent and family to conform, i.e. tolerances and contextualization? So I absolutely agree. So a lot of the research that I do um, um, goes along with training pre-service teachers to be more aware, more culturally responsive, all of those types of things because I think that it's a lot easier for us to reach those pre-service teachers than it is to reach every family in America. Um, we do wanna educate families as much as we can, but I think it's a lot 
it's a lot easier for us to work with those pre-service teachers and get the information that they need so that they can work with others versus trying to catch everybody. What do you think, Kelly? I missed the question. I'm not sure. I, oh, I, I'm looking is for it. it. Um, is, it uh, is it possible and would you agree that perhaps the change needs to start with teachers and administrators? Amen. Absolutely. I mean, and that's why that's why it that's why I mentioned that professional development um, and 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 so much Denise you had talked about teacher attitudes and absolutely I mean and, and that's the thing and it, we we look to the kids and and maybe just these that's why we don't have a good like little strategy to use um, because it's not an intervention um, that we can apply to the children if that makes sense this is something where it really requires self-awareness it requires getting really real with yourself and going, wow, how do I identify? What are the assumptions I'm bringing to this child? What are the assumptions that I'm bringing to this um, child's programming? And how am I mapping my own culture, my own values onto this behavior intervention plan? Um, you know, all of those things, because we do that. Um, and, and it'd be silly for us to say that we didn't. I mean, I think that a lot of us say, okay, well, there's evidence-based practices, but that's even culturally laden. Um, and I've done some work uh, myself and then West et al. They've done some work as well um, where we've looked at the, uh, the interventions, the evidence-based practices that are out there for children with behavior disorders or children with autism. And we looked at the participant sampling um, just to kind of see, you know, we're, we're building this evidence base, but who are we really representing? Um, and and, and who's implementing the, the evidence-based practices and so forth. And so I think we're still not to a place where it's quite equitable yet. Um, who's being represented in that identification category is not being represented in the empirical base. Um, and so even our, our evidence-based practices are not quite to a space where we can say um, that it's a, even that's culturally laden, I guess is what I'm saying. And anybody who studied culturally, I mean, sorry, evidence-based practices knows how challenging it is to become an evidence-based practice. So, um, so that is even just its own little tiny, um, it's its own little tiny space in and of itself. So all of that to say, yes, it's, it's all about being a reflective educator, a reflective administrator, cultivating a climate in your school that says we are going to acknowledge, honor, and accept differences. We're not going to deny them that they exist. We're not going to value one more over another. Um, I'm going to question whether my, when I get an emotional response to a behavior that a child's having, I'm going to step back and say, wow, why am I having that response instead of going, uh-uh, I don't think so. Get out of here. You're not doing that in this class today, right? We're, instead, we're going to step back and go, whoa, why am I having this emotional response? Because it's not personal, um, you know? So I, I don't believe that behaviors uh, are personal. Even when kids make them personal, I still don't really believe they're personal because I'm here to help. Um, so I don't believe it's personal. Um, but if I'm getting an emotional response, then I have to step back and think, why am I having that emotional response? And so it absolutely starts with the principal and I mean, sorry, the, the teachers and the administrators. So there is one more question that I found and it's within these different values and assumptions, how do we proceed with the special ed paperwork regarding behavior issue, issues? Um, essentially when you have these different cultural aspects from the system. How do you blend yeah. the disability and the cultural aspects when they're different, when they're contrary to each other? When they're contrary to each other? Yeah, you had a really good example, and I don't remember if it was just us talking previously or if it was from tonight, but um, you talked about how the culture will be different at home with some of your clients, but right. what's expected of them in their settings is completely different. And so you did kind of talk about the behavior switching or code switching between the right. two. And so I, I think really the question is, how do you address that within the paperwork? That's really interesting. So I think that, I think in my opinion, you want to establish from the beginning, um, even with your team, and I, I always include the parents, of course, in that team. But like when I'm drafting this IEP, this is, this is for the school, this is for the school setting. And so I acknowledge, I value, and I want to understand what's happening at home and in his community because if I can teach him things that would work here as well, 
and maybe, you know, especially if the child struggles with generalization, um, then if I can teach him things or support those things here, I want to make sure I do it. Um, but then you also want to be explicit in saying in the school culture, I'm in the culture of our school, um, this would be something, the expectation is that he, um, you know, I think I used the example probably, Denise, I have uh, some clients who are um, Pakistani and Muslim, and they use uh, lota to clean themselves after, after they defecate, right? So the toilet paper is not always something that's used. Um, and so unfortunately, in American public schools, they don't necessarily have access to the materials to complete the washing routine after they've defecated in the schools. So, um, you know, so that's something that a lot of Muslim American children have adapted to. Um, but when it's a child who's, you know, we're, de we're dealing with toilet training and, you know, we're, we're working on independence and so forth, then, you know, we do have to teach, all right, well, in the school, now we can, if we have access or we can provide something like that, um, like a little lota, which is just really a watering can, if we can provide something like that for the child, great. Um, but sometimes you go, oh, I don't know, our stalls are set up so that he would have to walk out of the stall, fill it up. I mean, it would become uh, a little too cumbersome. And so asking the parents, you know, would it be acceptable or, you know, I think in the school, it would be best that we teach him to use toilet paper to clean himself. Um, and the parents oftentimes, and I will speak just for the parents that I work with, that they do want their child to be able to operate fully independently and acceptably in, uh, you know, going, when they go to the bathroom in Target or Walmart or any of these stores that are out or restaurants, a lot of them don't have a lota for cleaning themselves, right? So they have to learn um, to live in these two different cultures if that makes any sense. So that's why I think, you know, a lot of times families who do have different backgrounds, they, they fully understand that um, things are different in different spaces. They understand that better than people that were kind of born and raised in America who uh, very much have adapted to um, middle, middle mainstream American ways, you know, meaning using toilet paper from a restroom and, and just basic things like that. Um, so, so it kind of sounds like you would still draft the, whether it's a IEP or any other document manifest destination, <laughs> manifest, um, all of that types, type of uh, IEPs and uh, special ed documents. So you would do them as you would any other, but right. you're taking into the cultural considerations that this might only apply to the school setting. Correct. And I think I would be explicit with the family. So this is something that, this is why I love the cultural reciprocity model so much is because I found that I, I used to teach a class fully in Spanish. And so a lot of my families were from um, different places in Latin and South America. And the way that they treat teachers are very, is very, very different than the way American children and families treat American teachers, right? And so, um, you know, a lot of the the families, it was whatever the teacher wanted, si maestra, si maestra, you know, whatever I wanted to do. So. So when I would ask for feedback or partnership, I'd say, well, what do you think about that? They say, I think whatever you want to do is what we're going to do. Like, I just think whatever you say is right. Um, and so that was really counter to all of my training in special education, because that's all about partnership and working with the families and collaborating. And it was something that they were just culturally not very comfortable doing because their idea is we just do whatever the teacher wants to do. Um, and so I think it's really important to, um, be, have those meetings with the family. And, and, you know, a lot of times, like I said, you can both be sitting there looking at the same thing and I'm seeing one thing and you're seeing another, um, or culturally they're not comfortable, uh, challenging the teacher or, or expressing even their own opinions. And so that's when you really need to kind of go, all right, Hey, at the school, we think this is really important. Do you think that's important? Or, or maybe what is it that it's at home, what do you think is important? Or where do you see your child? You know, and you really want to get that information from them. It's very similar to that, you know, these social validity assessments. But I do think being very clear about these are for educational purposes. This is what we're training him for. And that's why even in that transition planning, when we're thinking about where do you see him when he's 30 years old, um, you know, that's going to tell us a lot about the family's perspective on this child 
in what they want to program, how they want to program going forward. It was a lot, but does that yeah. make sense? <laughs> no, it so, makes right? sense to me. So hopefully it makes sense to everybody else. Yeah, right. I did already logged <laughs> off. They're like, we're done with these ladies. <laughs> I, I didn't find any other questions other than um, requests for access to the PowerPoint. And sure. Kelly and I will get that out uh, either, well, probably tonight, because if we don't, we'll forget. So we'll, right. we'll take care of that and we'll make sure that we get it out to um, Kim. Should we give that to you and you'll send it out or who should we send it out to? Oh, Shelly's on too. Yeah, so all of the materials you can send out to me and we have okay. everyone's email address here. So we'll be sending out a survey and also the certificate. Uh -huh. Oh, and a certificate. Okay. Excellent. And so I do see that Shelly Fraser Trotman Scott is on here and, and as well as Evie. I know that I am going to ask um, Kim to, if because um, I'm the publication chair for CCBD, I'm going to ask her to send a little uh, call out to all of the participants to see if they might want to send in um, anything really a review um, of this webinar or just kind of you know uh, just a little fun anecdote from their classroom um, or anything but I think it would also be fun for DDEL to have um, to in invite the uh, submissions for their newsletter as well because they love to promote membership as well so um, and so when is the next webinar um, I don't believe it's been scheduled yet, but if oh, okay. people would like us to reach out for that next webinar, we can, we can certainly add that to the, our contact list. Okay. Okay. Any Excellent. last questions? I think we are all set.